asked my buddy Kevin Connolly if he would jump on the show and talk to us a little bit about you know his entourage days uh, as well as uh, what he's doing now. So let's bring him to the show right now. Actor, uh, uh, podcast network owner, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call him. Dolphins fan and hockey aficionado, Mr. Kevin Connolly. What's up, buddy? How are you? Thanks for having me on, Ryan. Good morning to you. Good morning. So um, I was telling the guys here about the Victory Podcast. This was something you kind of came up with. You started a company called Action Park Media. And right. in the process, Doug Allen and Kevin Dillon and you, you know, decided to to put together, you know, you know, Entourage was such a, a huge show uh, in the mainstream for so long and to kind of bring it back in the eyes of the fans through episodic post uh, podcast. Tell us about that show and, and what you're doing with it right now. Well, you know, it, it's funny because we're, we're all, you know, a little, little bit older. So we're kind of from a, a different generation. So just having, trying to make Kevin Dillon understand what a podcast is, what <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> was interesting in itself and i think that you know i mean i had been been doing it for a while but when i approached doug and kevin about doing it it's just sort of like well what is what is it what is it exactly does it entail so at first it just kind of started out as us having fun but it's, it's become real nostalgic and you know time flies by so fast that you blink your eyes and you go man you know it was 15 years ago that we shot that episode so it really is sort of like podcast DVD commentary. You know, we go back, we talk about what we remember uh, filming this episode or, or, or that episode, which is also funny because what time does. Everybody has a different memory of <laughs> certain stories, you know. But um, we really have had a, had a blast, and it, it's, it's just kind of exploded. Uh, and now we're kind of branching out, you know, doing interviews. We had Charlie Sheen on the other day, which was uh, – which is pretty wild, but we're, we're, we're still having fun. And as long as you're having fun doing it, that's, uh, that's the way to, to keep it going because you could burn out on these things, you know. So. You know, most of our, our viewers and, and listeners were huge fans of the show. Kind of just take us back to what, what the beginning of that was like and how quickly it escalated into this, you know, this mainstream phenomenon and where you couldn't, you know, walk down the street in L.A. without – you know, it was, and you filmed in LA too, which was crazy all over the place. Just kind of tell us about what that was like to be a part of. Well, and also too, remember this goes back to pre-social media, right? So there was no, you know, Instagram and the Twitters of the world were just getting started. Uh, there was no TMZ. Uh, you know, if uh, you know somebody wrote a story about you, it was in the National Enquirer. You know, so. Right. We were, you know, we were, we were like a little, the little engine uh, that could. We, we started out as a small show, but at the end of the day, we had the, you know, 5,000-pound gorilla, which is HBO, behind us. Uh, and, and, you know, they hung in there with us, and, and the show caught on. And, uh, you know, you mentioned L.A. You know, uh, L.A. became, uh, in the Hollywood area, became uh, sort of the sixth character almost for lack of a, a better term. You know, people would watch the show and be like, oh, my God, I eat there. And people would come to L.A. and visit. And, you know, we really put Earth Cafe on the map. Too bad we didn't have a little piece of that restaurant, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, the, like, the opening scene uh, of, of the show I, was, was in I went now. Well, that I, was in Fred Siegel's. That okay. was in Fred Siegel's okay. uh, over on Melrose over there. Well, know? I told so. you this. I told you this the other day since, you know, having met you uh, about a year ago and, and – I went back during the pandemic and rewatched it. And I told the guys on Wednesday when we were going to have you on that I, I've rewatched it. And uh, um, as a 45 year old man now, I, I watch it and I'm like, oh my God, th these, these, these individuals aren't, aren't the greatest of people and are not telling the, the, the best stories. In fact, Kevin Connolly's character is probably the lead in this show now <laughs> with the moral compass of all this. I mean, as, a, as an adult and about to be dad, when you see old episodes and sometimes, what do, you, what, do you look at it as just fun or you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know if that was the best, best uh, you know, tutelage for young, young adults or not. Well, for sure. I mean, we, you, know, <laughs> we, you know, we look back at, and as we're rewatching these episodes before we cover them on the podcast, there are these, you know, cringeworthy moments where Kevin and I always have the, the benefit of being able to blame Doug because, you know, <laughs> he Doug wrote it. the writer and the creator and did all this kind of stuff. But 
you know, you know, the, you know, Doug will always say that the truth is that at the time, you know, if you look at a character like Ari Gold, you know, he he would lose his job in in thirty seconds for behaving that way in in, uh, in an office setting. But fifteen years ago, that's what it was. And there, you know, endless uh, examples of that. You know, and that's why it would be just different today. And when people would say, "Well, how would you reboot that show?" and would it look different? And the answer is, well, of course it would right. look different because it's a different world. Yeah, you know, um, you know, but but it, it is true. You kind of look back on it, and, and there are some super uh, super cringe worthy moments. But <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a, a time capsule, and that was sort of the time. So you really can't live in in, in the regret. And uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's definitely things that wouldn't fly. <laughs> but it, it's funny to your point, also, Ryan. You know, I was. You know, when the show aired initially, like, I was like, oh, this guy's the party. You know, my character was the party pooper, and I was all these things, and I was always killing a good time. And now looking back all these years later, it's like, what a great guy uh, he was, you know? Yep. When on the first run, I was the guy that uh, nobody wanted to invite <laughs> to the party. So uh, it's funny, you know, the dynamics shift. and uh, But, um, you know, it's also, too, the, the pandemic has just sort of brought in a whole new uh, audience. I mean, I... You know, I have young cousins, and these people are like watching it. And I'm thinking, wow, you were five right. when the show yeah. <laughs> when the show aired, and now you've seen every episode. So, um, you know, I think HBO Max has given it some new life, and uh, yeah, man, it's it, it's fun taking a trip down down memory road. Plus, it's at Action Park Media, so finally, I get to be Doug's boss and boss him around. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, yeah. We're we're talking to Kevin Connolly, actor and director. Uh, owner of Action Park Media. Tell us a little bit about that podcasting network uh, uh, kind of incubator you're, you're running and, and what, it, what it means and all, and all the great things you're doing. Yeah, you know, like you said, it's, the, the, it's, a, it's an incubator for sort of ideas. And, you know, um, for the, you know, victory is tricky because the, uh, the ultimate underlying rights are owned by HBO, so there's not really much room for, to take it out, out of the podcast space there. But you know, you do these. You know, you do these podcasts nowadays. They turn into uh, a, a Netflix docu series, and then they become a TV show. You know, and that's really that's really the the goal. You know, you, you do a cool podcast, and it could become a movie, a show, a documentary. This it, the sky's the limit, and it, and it really is sort of a new medium where people are are tapping into to get to get content, which is what uh, people need with all these new outlets. Uh, this this. Um, day has brought a couple blockbuster trades and you being from long, long island most people would think you were a jets or a giants fan but no you, you you became a dolphins fan over time and they were a part of these big trades i don't know if you noticed or or heard about it yet but they they moved out of the number three spot so it looks like they're going to stick with tua how did you like him in his first year and and what are you expecting from your dolphins in in, in year two under tua uh, well <laughs> You know, Ryan, you you were uh, you were the first guy to to put that in my head that you've been. I think you've been outspoken about Tua. Now, you know, you don't think that he's necessarily the guy. You got to understand for Dolphins fans to finally have this guy. I mean, it's great. I mean, we'll see. I mean, uh, it feels like they have the the confidence in him. And the but most notably about the Dolphins, what what has become apparent over the over the last few years is that people really like playing for this coach. You know, I mean, they just like him. They they go the extra mile for him. Um, I I don't know. I like I like I like things. I like the Dolphins uh, this year. I mean, you know, Buffalo's tough, but um, I like that they held on to Tua. And and who who are the Dolphins going to pick up? What what's it looking like? What's the prediction? I trust you. You're my go to football guy. Well, I I think they they get the they get the number six overall after a swap with the Eagles. So that puts them in prime territory for Jamar Chase, wide receiver from LSU, or Devontae Smith, wide receiver from Alabama. So I think they're going to go after a big time wide receiver class guy, and that that's going to be super. Helpful. I mean, if they re- reunite Devontae Smith with with Tua. I think that would be pretty fun. I have a, I have a question for you though. How does a uh, kid right. from Long Island? New York become a Dolphins fan? Oh, I have a theory. So, you know, you're, my dad, you're supposed to be a Jets fan. I, that's the other thing, too. Like, they, they, when you're from Long Island, they try to tell you what your teams are supposed to be, right? You're supposed to be Mets, Jets, or Yankees, Giants, right? There's, and if you're from Long Island, you're supposed to be Mets, Jets. I'm a Yankee Dolphin fan. Now, 
My brother, uh, I have an older brother. You know, he's seven years older than me. We had bunk beds. He was a Dolphins fan. In hindsight, I think he just wanted to have a a problem with my dad. <laughs> my dad was a diehard Jet fan. But that's the only thing I could make sense out of. And, and believe me, every year on the first day of the regular season, I call my brother and say, how could you do this to us? But the flip side is, if I were a Jets fan, <laughs> I wouldn't be much happier. Right? No. I mean, it's, uh, no, you wouldn't. It's six of one, half dozen of another. And, and um, yeah, so, but I, I like them. I like them this year. So we'll see. This could, be, this could be the year. And also, too, I don't jump teams. Right. But better or worse, I mean, I had a lot of tough years as an Islander fan. They're, You're loyal. They're the cup this year. You're loyal in the face of yeah, everything. I don't, I, don't, I don't switch teams. Okay. So, so you know, of course, I've, I've followed you for years, you know, from Rocky to, to the notebook, uh, all, <laughs> all, of these, uh, all of these things. But what really kind of puts you on my map is when uh, I watched a 30 for 30 that you did. Uh, on the the crazy story about the owner of the Islanders and how how it came about and everything that played into that, can you can you fill our listeners in a little bit about this story and how this this uh, this documentary came to be? Yeah, so yeah, we you know it was a thirty for thirty. It was called Big Shot, and um, you know, listen, I don't think it's any secret. Hockey, you know, at times is not something that everybody uh, wants to talk about on sports radio or, or whatever it is. You know, it's. Uh, it, it, you know, ESPN had, had only done one other hockey 30 for 30, and that was called King's Ransom about the Gretzky trade. But this really was a, 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 a business story with a, with a hockey background. And it's about a guy that um, essentially in the, in the days of, you know, the early 90s with the banks just giving away money, it's about a guy who, with a fake fax, borrowed $85 million dollars from Fleet Bank of Boston and purchased the New York Islanders, and he somehow slipped through the cracks because he ran in the right circles. Now, this story changed the vetting process for all the sports. It happened to happen uh, in hockey, but it changed the way they vet every owner. And um, this guy actually was in the driver's seat of a team for four months and it finally, one day, somebody turned around and said, wait, who is this guy? <laughs> and then, you know, they threw him in jail. But, but it's funny. This guy takes over. He fired the coach. He traded a couple guys. He's flying around on the team plane, and he has zero dollars to his name. And, um, you know, but he said, you know, uh, you know, it was the best four months of his life. You know, so it was a pretty wild story. Um, he's quite a character, and, and the ironic thing is that he ended up back in jail when the movie came out, which, you know, obviously wasn't my intention. But, um, yeah, he's just a, a, a professional con man, and, uh, you know, the fake it till you make it, um, he mastered that. So it's pretty cool, and like I said, I would always tell people, you don't have to be a hockey fan to enjoy that one. Go watch it because it's really cool. No, I, I recommend it to anybody out there who are fans of those types of documentaries, 30 for 30s, ESPN. It's great. So you and I were talking yesterday, uh, uh, you know, when I was making the turn and you were about to set off in that cold, cold ass weather we played in yesterday morning um, uh, about knowing TJ Jefferson and uh, a little story you guys had. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass it <laughs> off to TJ here and you guys can have a little conversation. All right. Kev, oh, Kev, what up? DJ, what's, up, what's up, man? I, you know, every, I think I think about it often. Do you want to take the lead? Well, you, well, you take the lead on this. All right, I'll take the lead on this. So, <laughs> Kevin and I, you know, this happened back, I believe, it was two thousand and seven. Whoa! It, yeah, so this was a long yeah. time ago, and you know, as I've told Kevin throughout the years, we don't see each other often, but you know, it's always like mad respect and love when I do see him. And I was kind of living in an entourage situation myself where I was Ashton Kutcher's roommate and so it was hard for me to like my friends back in Pittsburgh for me to try to explain to them what life had turned into out here until Entourage came on and I was like you see this this is kind of what's going on out here but in this particular day man it was uh there was a club called Area in Los Angeles down on La Cienega and so the story goes and I'm, I'm gonna cut some of this out because you know we'll save that for right. another time but Ashton calls me and he's like, what are you doing? I happened to be by the Beverly Center this night. Told him where I was. He goes, well, we're going to area. And I'm like, cool. I'm right down the street. So me being cheap, I didn't want to valet this car. Now, I have to tell you guys this. This car I was in was Wilmer Valderrama's Escalade. If you've ever seen Punk, the Punk episode where his car got destroyed, I was in this car. I borrowed it 
because my car had broken down and Wilmer was out of town. So I borrow his Escalade and instead of going to Park Valet, I decide right next to Trashy Lingerie on La Cienega was this street light. It was the brightest street light I've ever seen in my life. Like the sun didn't shine as bright as this. Lots of neon over there. And also too, TJ, give yourself a little credit. If you can find a spot <laughs> on the street and avoid the valet at a club like that. Yeah. It's a better play. On a Thursday okay. night. You know, so right. I, I I park right next to Trashy Lingerie under this Great bright spot. street Great light. Spot. Great spot. So we go to the area. <laughs> then uh, let's just say we went to another club. And we went to this other club for a while. And on the way back, Ashton had a car. So he's driving us. And Kevin goes, hey, there's a party in the hills. Do you want to come? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I said, I'll drive. So Ashton's car drops us (laughs) off at Wilmer's car. And Kevin and I go to the car. And I hit the alarm to unlock it. Okay. And I opened up the door. And when I tell you that, you know, sometimes you stare at something. And whatever you're staring at is pretty obvious. Like, I'm staring at Mike Del Tuva right now. (laughs) But I opened the car door. And what I saw, like, a thousand things went through my head. Because the steering column. But you were also very quiet. Now, I don't know any of this. I'm just like. You're just waiting to get into the passenger door. And I opened the door. And someone had taken a screwdriver, went through the the, the lock on the door. They had ripped the steering column out, and we, I supplied Don Bowie with some pictures of this last night in case this came up. They ripped the steering column out. They jammed the screwdriver into the ignition. I mean, and I opened the door, and I looked at this, and I was like, is this my car? Like, did this happen? And Kevin's like, bro, is this your car? And I'm like, I'm like no, this is Wilmer's car. And, like, you know, what had happened is somebody tried to carjack it, but in my mind, I was like, was it like that when I drove here? Like, all this stuff going through my mind. And then I'm like, oh, my God, no. Like, someone tried to steal this car. And Kevin's like, is this yours? I'm like, bro, this isn't even my car. So I had to call Ashton up. Ashton comes back. Kevin hops in Ashton's car. And Kevin goes to the party. Good so job. Me and Kutcher, Kutcher and I are sitting outside of Trashy Lingerie. It's 3.30 in the morning, and the cops come, right? So the cops come, and they're looking at the paperwork for the car and they realize this is Wilmer Valderrama's car. Why do you have it? And I'm trying to explain to them that I'm friends with Wilmer and blah, blah, blah. But you know, that's not going to fly. And luckily Ashton was just sitting picture right here. He was just sitting on the sidewalk and the cops happen to look at him and he nudges the other cop. He goes, look, he goes, what is this, a punk? And then the cops all start laughing and joking with Ashton. But meanwhile, I'm sweating because I took Wilmer's car and I didn't ask for it. So, and Wilmer was out of town. He was in New York. So the cops are all like laughing and joking with Ashton. Kevin took off. I'm sweating. Like, what am I going to do? I got to tell this dude. So it was 300 bucks to tow Wilmer's car back to his house. Oh. I had to call him in New York the next morning and go, hey, bro. Um, I took your car. I, I borrowed your car. because It he, got he, broken. He told me I could borrow it on Wednesday. He didn't tell me I could borrow it on Thursday, but I took it anyway on Thursday. <laughs> and Wilmer and I, will never forget this, we had like a 15-minute phone conversation, and four minutes was him yelling at me. <laughs> like, bro, why didn't you violate it? Why'd you park on the street? And then after that, after he got it out, he was like, all right, cool, bro, so I'll be home on Saturday. Let's go out. Let's, you know, let's get good dinner when I get back in. And that's how cool Wilmer is. He kind of like, he got mad for a second, and I was like humbled. He expressed and he like, himself. He and expressed then, himself, and no, he let it go. Yeah. But that's Kevin and I, that's the story. Every time we see each other, we talk about this time. <laughs> And Kevin was just the best. I, I, he was I, just I, like, I gotta say my, I gotta say my side. I gotta <laughs> say my part. Which is, right. So, first of all, the, the, in hindsight, whoever did that knew what they were doing. To take it even a step further, we probably walked up on them, which is scary at the same time, right? Yeah. They knew what they were doing. That column was gone. They were in there. Who knows? Maybe, maybe they heard us coming and they ran away. But I can remember you sit. I have this image in my head of you sitting in the car with your hands on the steering wheel, and you're just staring straight ahead, <laughs> trying to figure out: Is this the right car? I don't remember the car being like this. And I'm thinking, like, eh, maybe he's embarrassed. His car's a mess. You know? <laughs> hey, listen, my girlfriend's car looks like that. And nobody tried to steal it. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then you look at me and you're like, I think somebody tried to steal the car. And I'm like, that's ah, all right, man. You know, cars get messy sometimes. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. <laughs> I just thought you had a cracked steering wheel, bro. I really, but this was a professional job. I mean, they, they were in and out of there. And then, yeah, I remember standing on the street, we're like waiting for the cops. And I'm like, 
I don't know if a buddy of mine like called. I just like jumped in, but I did call you later on and go, "How'd it go?" <laughs> I, I, I remember, but every time I I see that, I, I think about that. And yeah, man, that was that was 14 years ago. Wow, that's pretty wild. How was that, that party, that by the way? That's for sure. What's that? How was that party, by the way? <laughs> I was going to say, the good news is the highlight of the night was the steering wheel, because I don't remember the <laughs> That's the, that's the but, kind of and stuff. I also didn't know until right now that it was Wilmer's car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. Funny, that's an awesome part of it. You talk about, like, the entourage. You talk about the entourage moment, right? Like, that's what it is. Oh, hey, by the way, Wilmer, uh, sorry, I took your car last night, and by the way, somebody tried to steal it. <laughs> yeah. But they did it. Yeah. That sounds like something Turtle would have done. That sounds like something Turtle would have done. <laughs> exactly. uh, Kevin Connolly, everybody, actor, director. Uh, uh, he's become a good friend too. That's that's pretty cool about yeah. all this. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do some we're gonna do some stuff together here in the next year and have a lot of fun. So appreciate you joining the show, buddy. Have a great day. Thank Go Dolphins, you so huh? Much appreciate, guys. Let's tee it up. Good talk right. to you, Kev. All right, I'll talk to you later, guys. Thank all right, you. bye. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.